All right, welcome everybody to our next seminar series. Today we have Dr. Patrick Barnard here. We overlapped a little bit while we were at Santa Cruz. He's with the USGS. They have a coastal and marine geology program there, and he heads that up. So I will hand it over to him. To, you can give him a little background sure. on yourself and then start off. Yeah, will do. Um, thank you. I'm a coastal geologist at the USGS. I've been there for about 13 years, and I'll tell you all about what I'm interested in and some of the research we've done as we go along here. But mainly going to focus on storm and climate change impacts to the California coast, and especially the kinds of storms like this one that hit Ventura in December, one of the biggest uh, wave events we've had in about 15, 20 years here. You can see the waves breaking over the top of the deck of the pier. But a lot of times I get asked, well, what the heck is USGS anyway? So <laughs> have a slide for that. Um, there's about 8,000 um, employees across the country and hundreds of centers, a lot in water resources. People always think earthquakes, they think USGS, and that's definitely what we do, but that's probably about a quarter of the employees throughout the survey. We do lots of other things. Throughout these main research areas, I'm probably going to be standing right in front it's of you. Good, a it's lot. all good. It's so, all good. It's all good. Um, ecosystems, hazards, climate impacts, natural resources, and then I'm in the Coastal Marine Geology Program, which is about 350 employees across the country, so we're really mm -hmm. small in the whole scheme of the USGS. We have a budget of about $40 million. The USGS budget as a whole is about $1.2 billion, which is really small in the federal government. <laughs> so sometimes we think we're too small to be cut out of the budget, and sometimes we think maybe we're so small they'll just think we can easily get rid of us, <laughs> depending on who the president, next president is going to be, but we should be pretty good. Um, what's nice is that we're non-regulatory, so we don't have any oversight, official oversight over what people do or do not do. So we can just do unbiased, independent science, there's no political pressure for us to say or do um, what other people want. So it's a really great position to be in as a scientist. So in Coastal Marine and um, Pacific Coastal Marine Science Center in Santa Cruz, where I am, there's about 110 of us. And we cover the whole Pacific region, uh, the West Coast, uh, Arctic, Pacific Islands. We do all manner of anything related to marine geology, coastal geology, so deep water, um, geophysics, phys you know, physical oceanography, marine geology, geochem, coastal ecology, engineering, a whole swath of different things. And about 10 of us, I lead the coastal processes team, um, and we look at near shore processes, coastal change, climate change impacts. So we have about 10 people, varies plus or minus, depending on how many postdocs we have and students and everything. So that's kind of who we are. Uh, these are our primary research interests, so large scale coastal change. Trying to understand how these coastal systems evolve on different time scales and different spatial scales, so from storms to climate change impacts, so sort of days to century time scales, and then um, sort of fundamental nearshore processes how um, do waves and currents move sediment through the surf zone, and how does this force beach change? And then we also use lots and lots of field techniques, try to integrate as many different tools as we can to get data to understand a system. So LIDAR, topographic um, surveys with uh, ATVs, bathymetric surveys, um, measuring waves, measuring currents, lots and lots of things. Using video, satellite imagery, pretty much anything that can give us more information about the coastal zone. And then also our work ultimately feeds into lots of coastal management decisions throughout the state and beyond. So trying to provide the science the public use, the public agencies can use to make decisions on the coast in terms of adaptation, um, mitigation, climate change impacts, things like that. So these are the kind, I'm going to try and stand over here a little more than you can see a little bit. Through there. So the kinds of things that my group collects, we do lots and lots of beach monitoring up and down the California coast. So we have ATVs with kinematic GPS on them. We ride up and down the beach. We make 3D maps of the beach. We've been doing this for about a decade up in Ocean Beach in San Francisco. Every month we have about 170 of these surveys. So it's a really high resolution look at how these beaches evolve through time. Um, down here in Santa Barbara, we've been doing this for um, about 11 years now. We do it twice a year. And also we just start up a program in Santa Cruz. And another group in the USGS has been mapping the Pacific Northwest. So these are actually for beaches are pretty long term data sets for North America. And you guys are doing the tide line or what are you guys doing the whole We usually phase? go at uh, spring low tides, so get as low <coughs> as we can. So try to get down to me low, low water during spring low tides, ideally. And then at high tides, we come out with the bathymetric survey as so we try to get overlap. So then we have a continuous surface. Um, so we understand how the whole system is changing. And that's important because about 90% of the change that you see is really below the water line or the high tide line. 
uh, ground-based LIDAR, and we also do aerial LIDAR, so scanning lasers to get really fine resolution information about cliffs and beaches, you know, or, you know, sub-meter, almost getting down to centimeter resolution now. It's amazing the technology now and the computing power to be able to gather these data sets and process them. We're doing a lot of work now with structure for motion, so we use paired aerial photographs to build DEMs. This is a it's, it's sort of an older technique that's being reapplied um, by looking, using aerial photography, oblique aerial photography. It's kind of coming along with the with sort of the advent of drones as well to collect lots of data really quickly. And now you're beginning to get topographic information that's almost the same quality as you're getting yep. from lasers. It's amazing. And you can do it quickly and at a fraction of the cost. So another of our bread and butter is nearshore monitoring. So we have jet skis with GPS and echo sounders. We go back and forth through the surf zone um, in some areas as much as four times a year and try and see how the near shore is evolving. This is just a, a bunch of surveys from Ocean Beach here, about 20 plus we've collected over the last decade or so to try to understand the seasonal behavior of bars and how it relates to the beach change. So that's you guys and not Rick Kvitek's stuff. Correct, correct. Yeah, Rick mostly surveys outside the surf zone this is really the only way to get inside the surf zone safely, especially a place like Ocean Beach where average waves are 2.4 meters or something and we can't get in there with a bigger yep. boat, right? That was my first date with my wife actually, was at Ocean Beach. Oh, <laughs> it was probably very cold. <laughs> it was cold, that's right, she still likes me, I know. It's weird. <laughs> so other things, you know, deploying oceanographic instruments, measuring waves and tides, a lot of video imagery, um, so you can basically get real-time information about rip currents and bar and trough um, configurations, uh, lots of seafloor mapping to understand the seafloor and how it evolves, um, ways to infer sediment transport directions by looking at bed forms, and then um, sort of classical grain size analysis. And so sort of non-traditional methods of grain size analysis here, we have a bed sediment camera called the eyeball. You can take, you know, two or 300 pictures and get the information through a MATLAB algorithm really within minutes where you take 300 samples back to the lab, you have a grad student working on it for about six months. So <laughs> trying to be more efficient with our data collection and, and getting as much as we can as efficiently as we can. And then a lot of numerical modeling. So we can have all these in situ measurements, but you really can't resolve a really complicated system. Like this is the mouth of San Francisco Bay, for example, looking at the current structure. This is the Golden Gate Bridge, is basically right here. This is the city of San Francisco. So if you had just a few point measurements um, from ADCPs, you're not going to be able to even begin to understand the complexity of a system like this without numerical modeling. So that's one of our biggest tools to understand how these systems um, really behave and using, however, this in situ instrumentation to validate these models and make sure we're actually getting the right answer. But you see all these really big eddies and things, and these are all reflected by what we actually see on the seafloor. But you really can't capture that even if you had 20 instruments across this transect the full resolution and complexity of such a system without modeling. So I'm going to talk about um, some of my current projects. Um, and they're really the first two, to some extent, kind of go together. Um, coastal processes studies, trying to understand these systems um, from many different perspectives, and then trying to kind of build out this information and tie it to um, climate change impacts and, and uh, data sets that have been collected across the Pacific and apply what we've learned locally to a more regional and sort of, sort of basin-wide problems. And then I'm going to also focus, and this actually ties to this one a little bit, uh, the Coastal Storm Modeling System, which was a system we developed to look at the impact of climate change on the California coast. Um, mostly looking at um, climate change impacts, but also um, some operational applications, which I won't get into today. But first, uh, talk just a few examples about coastal processes. So, We've had a program here in the Santa Barbara Littoral Cell for about 11 years, which uh, we defined from Point Conception to Magoo. And Kiki's gonna find out maybe if this is really a firm boundary or not. <laughs> it's been debated for decades. But we have high resolution sites. We do lots and lots of data collection around UC Santa Barbara, uh, Carpinteria, the whole Rincon Parkway, Santa Clara Ventura River Mouse, down to Magoo. And then we have regional surveys we've been doing um, also up and down this entire stretch. But we come twice a year, we map these beaches in very, very high resolution um, with Topo and with Baffy, and doing that for 10 years now. So we have a really good sense for how this system behaves. So here's an example of how we've used that data. So this is from uh, Goleta. 
So Isla Vista here, so this is your keg parties area, and a lot of, the, like a high rat population, I think, too. Um, but uh, so from Elwood here, Isla Vista, and Goleta Beach, so this is looking at sort of just short-term rates of shoreline change. So this is kind of typical of the whole region where you have really oblique waves. You have these sand waves that basically move down the coast. So you have maybe a kilometer where there's erosion kind of peaks and then accretion and then erosion and then accretion and these waves kind of move up and down the coast. So sometimes it depends when you actually measure things, what you see, but in general, these more west facing beaches are eroding and then you have kind of a mixed bag everywhere else to some extent. But what I want to highlight here is that there's this one staircase in the middle of Isla Vista, we worked with Dave Hubbard here, where he's been collecting just sand level data since 1993, I believe, on a daily basis. So we're going to talk about that just for a second and how it relates to these more regional surveys. So this is Dave Hubbard's data from that one area, just sand levels at one point on one beach. This is just through 2010. He's still going through 2015. I just looked at his most recent data set. So pretty much on average, every other day he's been out there. And uh, we did a running mean through here, and you see the very obvious sort of seasonal fluctuations typical of the California coast. Um, but there's also a lot of longshore sediment waves moving through, so it's a little bit more complicated than that. But the point is that what we found by looking at this one point at the bottom of the stairwell, it explains about 60-70% of the variability we observe across the whole cell. Right? So you could say, well, what are we doing? All we've got to do is measure this stairwell sand level and we got the whole story and you do get a pretty good picture of what's going on throughout the entire region from this one area so that was really interesting so from a scientific perspective you can find that one point this probably isn't quite it but it's close that is representative of a huge area you can get a lot of information about finer scale resolution um, uh, topographic change <coughs> than trying to go ahead and survey all the time which is just really not feasible so so that was interesting, the, the, there was actually a pretty good correlation with our regional surveys. And then we looked at things like wave energy and not surprisingly it just dominates the signal. So the bigger the waves, the less sand there is. Um, but there are also these less intense peaks as we uh, like did a Fourier transform basically through that data set. And you see you know, wave energy uh, peaks on the scale of 45 to 90 days, which is like seasonal stuff in California, pretty typical. But there's also like some effect of the lunar cycle, high, you know, basically of neap tides, spring tides, there's some effect on the beaches. We've kind of known this anecdotally, but it's really hard to quantify unless you just survey all the time, what Dave basically did. So there is an effect on the tides. So we always wonder if we're kind of biasing what we're doing by always surveying at spring low tide, and we probably are a little bit. It's not a strong signal, but it's definitely in the data. And there's also a pretty big lag here at this site of about seven to eight months or so, uh, the last seven to eight months of wave energy. So it's such an longshore dominated system, there's so much discharge out of watersheds that we think that um, you have these big wave events, it erodes a lot, I mean, there's a lot of rain that winter, and then eventually these sediment waves move along shore and eventually get there. And it kind of depends where you are, how long the lag is probably, and how far you are from a watershed. But there's a lot more in there, and it's a very interesting site. And then very long-term anomalies, and um, an example of this now is this El Nino winter, for example. He's seen the lowest sand levels um, since 1993, so huge effect. Um, it's probably going to last for more than 15 months like the last big El Nino did in terms of depressed sand levels, and we're seeing that throughout the Santa Barbara littoral cell. So I can save this. I have just some links to papers and stuff if anybody wants more information. Um, but then uh, here's an example from the Santa Clara River mouth, which is really interesting to us and to Kiki. It's this, a very, very episodic system. So there's a very large flood, the last one that I know of in January of 2005, and it delivered about 10 years worth of sediment in about three days to the coast. So basically 10 times the amount of sand that moves along the coast was delivered in three days. So it's super episodic. And this is what it looked like right after that event. There's just this debris everywhere, completely changed the ecology of the system for sure. It changed the geomorphology of the system. And so we really got interested in that. We just started surveying when it happened, and this is just uh, looking at the shoreline data. This is where it built out after the flood in 2005. Here, the red line. This is a very old aerial photo, so you can kind of just get, use that for reference, but not for the geomorphology. And then the shoreline just beat back really quickly over the next three years, and it continues to do so because there hasn't been a big event out of that watershed since. 
So this just shows the rates. So right at the river mouth, it built out, you know, order 200 meters, a little bit less. And the last three years, it's been eroding of right after the survey as much as 50 meters per year. So among the highest rates anywhere that's been recorded in the world. Um, and now it's down to about 10 meters a year if we updated this. But then there's a big wave moving down coast. You have lots of accretion down coast, and now it's probably down in Oxnard Shores, and Channel Islands Harbor dredging is recording this. So super dynamic system. We're waiting for another big storm to see. Is this an anomaly happens every 10 years, or is this something that is sort of a once-in-a-lifetime event? But from what we can tell so far, it may be a, sort of a once-in-a-lifetime event. So. Uh, right away, the shoreline prograded about 170 meters that we recorded. I think it was much, much more if we'd actually wow. went right afterwards. Um, and then, like I said, the retreat rates order 50 meters a year for three years right after the flood. And this is the highest that's been recorded really anywhere in the world except for the Nile Delta that I know of um, that's been quantified. I'm sure there are areas where this type of behavior happens, but it hasn't been recorded in the literature. And like I said, it's the equivalent of order, you know, 10 times, exactly eight times, but order, you know, 10 times the annual average, about 5 million cubic meters of sand delivered from this basically one event that happened over three days. So we're talking 500,000 dump trucks of sand to the coast, three days, and then there hasn't been really anything in the last decade or so. Okay, so then we've used this data set here um, in the Santa Barbara and then tried to pull it together with the stuff we've done in Northern California, some work that Scripps has done in Southern California, and then some other partners up in the Pacific Northwest to look at the impact of all these beaches and along the same um, spatial, um, spatial scales and try to understand how El Nino affects all these beaches, if it's synchronous, if there's some kind of um, variable impacts. And so we looked at all those sites. And what was really special about 2009-10, it was a Central Pacific El Nino, so-called El Nino Motokai, which means it's sort of like an El Nino, but not quite. Um, it's where the warm sea surface temperature anomalies in the Central Pacific and not slammed up against the Eastern Pacific like it is right now. Um, and so the question was, well, are these beaches going to erode just as much during one of these events? Because there's also a climate imprint on it. There seem to be more and more of these Central Pacific El Ninos coming now. It seems to be fueled by global climate change. No one's quite sure, but order one question is, is it having as much of an effect? So this is uh, maybe a little hard to read, let's see, but um, this is looking at the wave energy anomaly over the last um, 12 years when this study was done. So this is the big El Nino in 97, 98, and you see a pretty big wave energy anomaly, about 30% above normal for most of the sites. Um, and then this is 2009-10, scrunched right on okay, the right-hand side here. And it's pretty consistent. It's a little bit less, but it's broadly consistent with that classic El Nino 97-98. And there's really nothing in between that comes close when you average them all together. Uh, the other factor, this is wave direction. Waves come way more out of the south um, during El Ninos, um, classic ones. And also they did the same thing during the Central Pacific one. And this is the water level anomaly. So that was much higher during the classic El Nino, a little bit less, but trumping almost every other year for the Central Pacific. So not as big of a water level anomaly, but as it turns out, um, the erosion was just as extreme, especially in California. So um, it was comparable in terms of erosion. This is the data set for all these different sites in the Pacific Northwest, as well as California. And this is so this is before that El Nino, this is after that El Nino. There's a huge excursion in the seasonal signal for all the sites in California. Much more variable in the Pacific Northwest, so it's definitely more focused in California. But the wave energy was 20% higher, the winter erosion was about 36% higher. So what we learned is that it's definitely consistent with a classic El Nino. And if we're going to get more of those, we can have more winters like this. So if you want to check some more on that, there's a GRL paper here. So then we said, okay, we got getting some sense of what's happening in the western um, coast and west coast of North America. What about if we pull our data together with some sites across the Pacific Basin? So we uh, started a collaboration with folks in Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, um, and looked at their data sets. And they've got some incredible coastal change data sets that go back as much as 40 years in Australia. Amazing stuff here, actually, near Sydney. Kiki and I were just talking about that earlier. In Japan, they have a site where they've collected daily um, cross-shore profiles for uh, 26 years or so. Wow. So it's an incredible data set. So 
we pulled all these together and analyzed them. The idea was we looked at lots of different types of climate variability, but in the end, El Nino was just trumped everything. It dominated the signal, either, I should say, the El Nino Southern Oscillation dominated, so either El Nino dominated or La Nina dominated, but it was the dominant mode of climate variability across the entire Pacific. So we looked at 48 beaches across five countries, three continents, and in the end we had about 650 years of total coastal change data from those sites. So here's a sort of a high level synopsis of what we found. So this is when we have El Nino, um, not La Nina. So this is the other end of that El Nino Southern Oscillation cycle, which is what we're having right now. So when that happens, all these sites in the Eastern North Pacific, wave energy goes way up 18%, 32% in California, Hawaii 18%, and correspondingly, our, the wave energy is suppressed in the Southern Hemisphere. So Australia, New Zealand, Japan's kind of a mixed bag. If you're north facing, it goes up. If you're south facing, it goes down. So the average is not getting a whole lot. Um, and all the increases are during boreal winter. So it doesn't matter where you are, Southern Hemisphere, boreal winter is the dominant season where this um, becomes pronounced. Um, and if you look at annual patterns or other metrics of wave energy, like extremes, it all pretty much jives pretty well. So then if you flip it to La Nina, which is what we're kind of moving into now slowly, we're just on the edge of still being El Nino, we'll probably get a La Nina. Um, wave energy goes up in the Southern Hemisphere, mostly goes down in the Eastern North Pacific, uh, but Pacific Northwest gets blasted by both actually, so they kind of get the short end of everything. They get mm -hmm. hit by both of those events. Um, but what we really care about is shoreline erosion in the end. What does this forcing actually do to the coastal system? So El Nino, and this is a slightly different metric we've used before, but basically it forces shorelines to their, maximum, their minimum position that we've seen historically or very close to it in almost all cases in all sites in the eastern North Pacific, and similarly depressed, so much less erosion um, in the southern hemisphere. And then a little bit more complicated with La Nina, and there's also local effects, but in general, big signal in Australia, especially the East Coast, a bit of a mixed bag in uh, New Zealand, and up a little bit, but a mixed bag in the more southerly sites, the Northern Hemisphere, but huge signal in the Pacific Northwest. So again, they're kind of getting it from both ends. So what we realized, and we looked at lots and lots of different modes of climate variability, the PNA, the PDO, everything, El Nino just dominates the signal no matter where you are. Either it's El Nino or La Nina, but you're going to get it. And often the impacts sort of oscillate between Eastern North Pacific and Southern Hemisphere, or between the Eastern and Western Pacific. Um, but there's also correlations with lots of other these um, climate indices and modes of climate forcing. But sort of the take home message is that the most recent projections of El Nino or increased El Nino uh, magnitudes, not necessarily more frequent events, but bigger events like we're having right now and followed by very large La Nina events over the next century. So if that is the case, then pretty much all these populated areas across the Pacific are going to get hit one way or the other, independent of sea level rise. And more information on this, the paper came out in Nature Geoscience uh, last fall, it kind of summarizes this. Okay, what's going on right now? And it's been a huge El Nino, SST, the sea surface temperature, is at historically um, high levels. Um, consistent with the extreme El Ninos in 82, 83, 97, 98. Um, the water level anomalies, so the whole winter it's been 15 to 20 centimeters higher everywhere because the water is warmer. Warmer water takes up more volume, it's called the steric effect. So we're already starting with, let's say, 50 years worth of sea level rise during, so it's kind of can be used as a proxy for what we can see more of in the future. You know, we already have, you know, higher sea level during this winter and then we have extreme wave energy, about 45% above normal, which is the highest on record. And then the one site we have beach erosion data now analyzed here at Ocean Beach, it's about 40% above normal, so about as high as it ever gets. And there's a West Coast LIDAR flight in the air now to try and characterize this across the entire region. And it's certainly not isolated to Northern California. These are all sites in your neck of the woods here, Isla Vista. This is the biggest scarp I've ever seen at Goleta Beach. There's pipes sticking out and soil that no one has seen forever. Um, <laughs> incredible. I mean, this is a person right here. So we're talking about a 10-foot high scarp. 
huge. And then a um, big event there at the Ventura River Mouth, right there at Surfers Point, um, was pretty. F those kinds of events were very frequent this winter. Okay, so that is sort of chapter one. And now I'm going to talk mostly about climate change. And this is a video that NASA put together, and it looks at temperature variability over the last uh, you know 120 years or so. And what you're going to see is it just stepped through year by year um, with the 1950s as a baseline. This kind of covers the period where we have pretty good measurements of temperature across the globe. And so the cooler colors are cooler and the warmer colors are warmer. And we'll see if we'll get it to run. And so this is, a, I think, a really illustrative sort of video of really what's happening out there. And I'm not here to advocate for uh, a particular view on climate <laughs> You're <neutral>. change. You're <laughs> neutral. <laughs> uh, but I think as an objective observer, if you look at something like this and you see how much the climate is warming, the globe is warming, especially in the poles, and especially over the last 20 years or so, it's pretty clear that there's something going on. Do you appear to be biased? <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can draw your own conclusions. And there's a really nice book that John Englander put out. Some of you may have read it. It kind of breaks down climate science to a real sort of fundamental level. And he's got a lot of, well, I pulled out some of these factoids from there that kind of, that are worth considering if you're making up your mind or if you're trying to convince someone else that there's something we should probably be worrying about or maybe something we should be thinking about doing. Um, and these are just a few examples. You know, one is we basically, based on the, the Lankovich cycles, the orbit of the Earth around the sun, and it's all the different modes of variability, we should be cooling right now, we're clearly not. Um, the rate of temperature increase over the last century is about 50 times faster than any time in the last 20,000 years. You know, CO2 has gone up 20,000 times faster than any time in the last half a billion years, so that we are having an influence. I think that's very clear. Um, 15 million years ago, global temperature was about six degrees warmer, um, but sea level was 30, me 30 meters higher. This is one of the big challenges now that a lot of sea level rise scientists are trying to figure out is the response time of a system. So we know in the past we've been warmer, and we've had much, slightly warmer, but much, much higher sea level rise. So. This is kind of where we're trending, and the big question is how long will it take us to equilibrate to this kind of sea level rise on the path that we're currently on? And even just 125,000 years ago, we were just two degrees warmer, but sea level was about eight meters higher, so about 26, 27 feet. And then we're kind of looking at a meter of sea level rise. That's where all the projections are taking us over the next century, about three feet. But we've had these periods in the very recent past um, during the late Pleistocene where sea level rise went up five meters a year for 400 years. So every century, 20 meters in four centuries. So the question is, can we get there that quickly now? And that's something that is sort of the state of the science of trying to figure out whether that's possible or not. So I'm just going to go through a tiny bit of sea level rise 101 before we really get into some of the flooding projections. This is from IPCC. So the question always comes up, well, why is sea level rising? Well, there's a, a number of factors. The main ones is the melting of land-based ice. Um, right now, sea level is rising about three millimeters per year. About a millimeter of that is coming from ice sheets, Greenland pr primarily. The other millimeter per year is coming from glaciers. Um, and then the other third of that, the other millimeter a year, is the steric effect. So the ocean's getting warmer, it stores heat, it expands, sea level rise goes up. Um, and depending what time frame you look at, those relationships vary a little bit, but it's pretty much a third, a third, a third right now. But then you have lots of regional effects as well. It's not just one big bathtub and everything is exactly the same across the world. Um, you have local, regional, surface, and deep ocean circulation changes and patterns. You have local subsidence. This is a really big factor in some parts of Los Angeles where sometimes the, the land is subsiding um, much faster than the sea level is actually rising. So that's a factor to consider. And also water storage. Actually, all the dams that were built over the last 50 years in Asia you can, is actually curbed sea level rise a little bit because they're basically trapping that water that otherwise would get to the ocean. And then on the flip side of that, all the groundwater extraction also um, feeds more water into the hydrologic cycle and down through the tributaries into the ocean. So those are 
these are sort of in the in the noise here, but these are the really the big ones: the steric effect, the melting of land-based ice, and there's other factors which I'll show you in a second too. Over much larger time scales, as ocean basin configuration, so big big scale plate tectonics, smaller basins, shallower basins, you're going to have much much higher sea level, and then on shorter time scales, wind patterns, tidal time scales, storms. But just keep in mind that all the current ice we have stored is the equivalent of about you know, 80 meters of potential sea level rise. So if we're ice free where we have been in the past, you know, we're going to be about 80 meters of sea level rise. See, 80 meters increase, we're talking you know, 270 meters or 270 feet of potential sea level rise. Okay, so historically, this is looking at um, you know, last half a, bil half a billion years or so. Um, so you see sea level has fluctuated maybe as much as 500 meters, you know, 1,600, 1,700 feet, mostly because of this ocean configuration thing. So very shallow oceans, much smaller. Um, we had really, really high sea level in the past, and it's fluctuated as the plates have moved around and different things. And then this is looking at, at just the Pli late Pleistocene area um, here through these different glacial cycles, which is the dominant mode of variability over sort of 10, 20,000 year time scales. This was the last glacial maximum where lots of North America was under about a kilometer of ice. And then we've had very rapid increase over the last uh, 20,000 years shown down here up until about, you know, five, 6,000 years and we went pretty flat. So there are these periods though where we only had a degree or so really of temperature increase like during meltwater. Pulse 1A we went up as I mentioned before, you know, 20 meters of sea level rise in fourth century. So we know we can do it. And it's a question of when it's going to happen <laughs> and we're never going to do anything about it. So well, what's going on now? Okay, so global sea level rise is accelerating 20th century, about 2 millimeters per year. Um, in the last 20 years, since we have satellite altimetry, which is basically radar-based information that also covers the entire globe, it's gone up by about 50%. But it's not uniform. So this is a map. Last 20 years, we have satellite altimetry of sea level rise rates across the globe. And you see it's highly variable. You see a really, really big signal, about a centimeter per year in the western Pacific, and this is where we've had prevailing westerly winds, very, very warm water. So that's where we're seeing these island nations that are just on the verge of really complete ecological and human hab habitation collapse right now. I mean, they're barely on the edge. A lot of these, they're having so much sea level rise and already very, very low line. Uh, the West Coast has mostly been spared. We've had these sort of upwelling, favorable winds, cooler water, denser water, a little bit less sea level rise. And then you also see these bulges like around Greenland because there's this big ice mass. It's the magnet basically pulls sea level rise up. So you have higher sea level rise around these big ice sheets very commonly. But when this melts, it gets redistributed. And most of that melting, the effect is felt actually around the equator. So. When we look at future projections in California, we're actually more affected by the melting of Greenland and Antarctica than anyone in the southern hemisphere or the far northern hemisphere. So it's a so-called um, glacial fingerprinting effect. That's not something people just gotten a handle on the last five years or so. Okay, and what about storms? In California, that's what we really care about. This is when things really go down here. Um, well, over the last 20, 30 years or so, there's been an increase in wave energy, wave height along most of the west coast. Um, the waves have been getting bigger, um, faster, and the bigger waves have been getting bigger, faster in the Pacific Northwest, and less of a signal as you get down toward Southern California, so it's almost flat. So, um, But the further north you go, the bigger the waves have been getting over the last uh, 30 years or so. And this is tracking extratropical cyclones over the last 50 years or so. And there's been a market increase in the number of events over the last 50 years. So something's going on there as well. Um, also, El Ninos seem to be maybe changing styles. I kind of talked about that from this sort of um, classical El Nino where the sea surface temperature anomaly is along um, the west coast of the Americas to this more central Pacific mode. But this is the one we're having right now. So I think this is still a lot of work to be done in that area. What's going to happen in the future? Okay, so this is kind of where we're headed now, what we're trying to model at USGS. And there's lots of sea level rise projections to use. This is actually quite old um, now, this suite of studies. But the, science, the projections haven't changed that much. The science has gotten better. 
the uncertainty has gotten better. But if you look out toward the end of the century, um, the sort of target is about a meter plus or minus 50 centimeters. So I think there's a fair amount of or growing confidence that that's kind of the number to look at, about a meter of sea level rise in the next century. Um, and I can have other slides on that. We want to talk about that later. There's a lot more detail. But, but there are models now looking further and further out. And the most recent paper that came out of Nature believes that the amount of CO2 in the system, the amount of ocean heat stored in the system, we're going to have sea level rise for many millennia, no matter what we do now, even if we stop right now. Um, this particular model was just looking out several more centuries. So you could make the case, well, we can argue kind of where we're going to be at 2100, but this is not a wall. It's not just going to stop. It's going to keep going. We're going to have multimeter sea level rise no matter what we do. So the kinds of decisions we make now are actually going to affect um, what's going to happen centuries from now and maybe even millennia. Okay, so what about in our backyard? Okay, well, NRC, the National Research Council, did a study, and they project for the sort of greater Southern California area about 28 centimeters of sea level rise by mid-century, close to a meter by 2100. This includes lots of these sort of global regional effects, these local effects, um, wind circulation, sea level rise fingerprinting from uh, glacial melting, um, glacial isostatic adjustment. So. We actually are um, falling now because when ice sheets cover the northern part of North America, um, they compressed the fluid mantle, we went up, and now those ice sheets are gone, we're depressing, so we're actually subsiding, that's called GIA, glacial isostatic adjustment, about a millimeter per year. Um, what about storms, though? Well, Bromirsky did some work down at Scripps, and we did also looking at f global climate models and how that may uh, feed into wave models and what the ultimate wave climate will look like and we found there's really not much change projected for our area for the next century um, but the big events are going to come more out of the south so that's actually kind of a big deal for this area also where wave sheltering shadowing and the channel is really a huge deal and even a few degrees can make a big difference if you're exposed or not and i know for surfers out here it's you guys know where to find the good waves and exactly what angle you know if you're going to go to rincon or whatever you're going to go or surfer's point, it makes a huge difference where those waves are coming from and what gets affected. Okay, I mentioned this before. Um, big factor for us is El Nino events. Are we going to have more or less? The most recent research by Kai et al. Nature suggests more frequent extreme events, like I said. And what this means, based on the work that I showed you before, is that we're going to have about a doubling of winter erosion during these events and heightened wave energy of about 30%. So if we're going to have more El Ninos, we're going to have more of these types of severe impacts like we're experiencing right now. Okay, so why do we care in the end? When does it really matter for the coast and coastal systems and coastal ecology and resources? Well, it's a global problem. It's a local problem. Um, coastal flooding is projected to displace about 200 million people worldwide, and that's only looking at sea level rise, only not storms, which just dominate the signal um, in our neck of the woods. Uh, you know, nationally, we're talking about a trillion plus of damage, again, just due to sea level rise, not considering storms or anything like that. And in California, this equates to about half a million people affected, displaced, a million jobs, and $100 billion in property at risk based on some pretty conservative projections from about a decade ago now. But lots happens during these El Nino events, and 82, 83 caused about $2 billion in damage, and 97, 98 caused a billion in damage along the California coast. So these are the, the confluence of sea level rise and really big storms in the future is also going to be a big factor. Okay, well, there's all these factors we have to consider. We're trying to build a modeling system. We're trying to develop vulnerability assessments that consider all these factors so people can plan appropriately. We don't want to just do a bathtub sea level rise because there's a lot more that goes into it. I mentioned these regional factors. Um, also mentioned a lot of these local factors, how to get a handle on subsidence and fluvial discharge and sediment supply, and then these seasonal and storm impacts, which are really the, the big one in California. Um, the seasonal steric effects and then the big waves and storm surge and river discharge that occurs during these coastal storm events. So we're trying to build a system that incorporates all these factors um, so we can make the best projections possible. So there's kind of two approaches that are out there right now. One is the NOAA Sea Level Rise Viewer, which some of you may have checked out. It's a really good tool, really good first order screening tool. It has very good topographic information, 
Um, if you want to look at the daily impacts of sea level rise, this is a really good place to start because it only includes tides. There's no storms. There's none of that. Um, but it'll tell you what the daily impacts will be. And it goes up to six feet of sea level rise, so it covers most of the sort of plausible ranges of sea level rise, and it's a national product. It's done consistently. But the limitation is it only looks at your average conditions and doesn't even include your average waves. But it's a really nice place to start. So we've kind of taken the opposite tack to try and include all these dynamic components of water levels, how they fluctuate in these really short time scales related to storms. So we include wind waves, river discharge, vertical land movement, um, and a huge range of sea level rise and storm scenarios. So if you want to plan for an annual storm tomorrow, we have that scenario. If you want to plan for something out a century or more, you can do that. Um, and it's called COSMOS, the Coastal Storm Modeling System. And this is just the same example uh, from um, the sort of basically eastern Long Beach area. Here's Seal Beach right here, Belmont Shores, et cetera. So this is basically you know, looking at just your sort of average daily conditions. And then this is um, a big uh, extreme storm on top of the tide and everything else. So you can kind of obviously see the huge difference in vulnerability. Look at these two approaches. So this is, this is why we really care. Okay, so this is a typical like extreme storm in California looking in the future. Um, sea level rise, let's say about a meter. The tide varies by about 1.2 meters. This is kind of where the static approaches, the bathtub approaches stop. Um, but then you have to consider the seasonal effects about 20 centimeters or so in Southern California during a big event storm surge, another 40 centimeters. Way, and the big factor though are waves. Waves set up, so when waves break, they super elevate the water level in the surf zone. That can be 1.2 meters or more. Um, you know, we're talking about five feet. And then the uprush of individual wave bores, another half a meter. So this is just a really a conservative approach to look at daily impacts. But if you want to look at extreme impacts, this is the approach that we're we've been putting together and advocating, which adds you know, many, many feet to total water levels and is ultimately what you need to plan for if you have to deal with extreme events with your infrastructure or whatever your resource may be. Okay, so this is what sort of drove us to build this tool called Cosmos, um, the really the first physics-based system for looking at hazards across the entire West Coast. Um, so we have a full range of sea level rise scenarios plausible sea level rise scenario, zero to two meters, and an extreme scenario, five meters as well, and then storm possibilities from no storm to your 100-year return level event. So pretty much everything under the sun. And a lot of this has been developed with lots of different federal, state, local agencies to figure out what they really want in the end. You know, we're not trying to be scientists tolling away um, in isolation and producing something no one's going to look at. We work with lots and lots of agencies across the state to give them the kind of tools and products that they can actually feed right into their planning efforts so they can make the decisions they need to make. So um, that's been the emphasis um, over the years in trying to really build the ideal user-friendly tools that can be used um, effectively. So this is basically how the modeling system works. What we do is we take the latest global forcing from climate models developed for IPCC, um, and most recently the uh, fifth assessment um, suite of models. And so we feed these wind fields into a global wave model. And this is our global wave model here. And you s may say this is over modeling or why are you doing all that? Well, especially in Southern California, we're actually affected by these Southern Ocean um, wave events. And and we get these long period south swells like you guys have seen at Malibu and other sort of iconic places that are formed by either storms down in Mexico or all the way down the Southern Ocean. They're important for coastal behavior, coastal flooding. So we, ha we have to understand the entire wave climate of the Pacific Basin to get it right in just these little tiny areas right here. And the one area actually almost all the models agree on is that the Southern Ocean is going to become a lot more energetic um, in the future. So then we uh, scale down through a series of nested procedures until we're at using the native resolution of LIDAR, basically one or two meter resolution on the ground for our flooding projections. So we're going from sort of order 200 kilometer scale wind forcing down to two meter footprints of flooding on the ground in your local community. And this is where we've done it so far. We've done a lot of work in the Bay Area and San Francisco wrapped up the last few years. We did some initial work in SoCal and we're wrapping up some um, more advanced work in Southern California now. 
and we're going to cover the rest of the state over the next two years. So we have a systematic, um, consistent approach for the whole state that the agencies can then turn to and use for their planning purposes and their permitting purposes and things like that. So I'll just walk you through a few of the initial results we had from the earlier work. This was uh, over in the Santa Barbara Airport area in Goleta, um, and sort of the first version of Cosmos, which was pretty simple. Just looking at a historical storm, which was the biggest one in the last decade before the December storm of this last winter, January 2010, and then coupled that with some sea level rise scenarios. So right away, it's very <laughs> clear to see the vulnerability of the Santa Barbara Airport. Um, but, but for this type of event, which is about a 10-year return level event, um, it's maybe a little bit further out, sort of the 100-year time horizon. Um, and then up in southern, in uh, central and northern California, we really ad advanced the work by partnering with the cyber structure team at Point Blue, and they built this web tool now, which is online. Anyone can go and check it out and interact with the data. It has about, it serves up about 100 gigabytes of data on the fly, so it's really nice. Um, we produce about 20 to 25,000 um, files for our, all our model runs, and that's not, um, very wieldy for most people. And so it's all integrated with this tool now. You can pick if you want to look at flooding or you want to look at how big the waves are going to be or the currents, or the uncertainty of the flooding, what sea level rise do you want to pick, what storm frequency, lots of other um, shape files you can put in here. And then look at what the results are. So this is just an example from Pacifica, south of San city of San Francisco, with no sea level rise and about a 2100 um, projected um, sea level rise about 1.25 meters, so out about you know 80, 85 years or so, and say so very minimal flooding. These areas in green show areas that are below the flood surface but not connected to the ocean. This is kind of a static approach, and then this is the dynamic approach. Where then you put a storm on top of that sea level rise, and you see that the vulnerability increases significantly. So the being able to roll this tool out really helped gain visibility and help people actually be able to use the data a lot more effectively in their planning needs. And there's some really nice um, uh, data download tools and you can import and export shape files for your area of jurisdiction. So there's lots of bells and whistles that we built into the tool based on the feedback. And then moved into San Francisco Bay and with the same tool and one of the big advances here was really honestly incorporate uncertainty in our projections of flooding. So what we have as the flooding typically is just the bullseye of the model, but the, that is not the answer. It's not one answer that you draw on the sand. There's uncertainty in the elevation data we use, in the modeling itself, in the vertical land motion, in tidal marsh behavior. And so we tried to include that in beginning in our work in San Francisco Bay. So here's just an example from San Francisco Airport uh, just 25 centimeters of sea level rise, so really, if, you know, several decades out in an annual storm, and they have a very big project now at SFO to try and sort sort out their issues because they are many and they're very <laughs> very low. It's probably ground zero for climate change impacts in the state, you could argue. So that right now, if you looked at this, you'd say, okay, well, maybe we just kind of seal up this levee here. We can. It's not too big of an issue. But if you look at the worst case scenario, if you look at all the model uncertainty, it can sometimes be a really narrow margin. All of a sudden, if your DEM's off by 10 centimeters, you're beyond that threshold, and all of a sudden you have a really big issue. And if you're a very high value piece of infrastructure like the airport, this is the kind of thing you need to plan for. Not necessarily the bullseye of the model, but you know, what is really the worst case that could happen if the model is as far off as we think it could be. So that's included. So now we've come back to Southern California. We've developed a little bit more of an advanced approach, and this is pretty much how it works. So we're still downscaling the global waves, um, using the global winds to build a wave model and then downscaling to regional level, so sort of the Southern California bite scale. We have wave models and um, hydrodynamic flow models. And then very, very high resolution models down to about 10 meter resolution as you get down to very, very fine site specific scale. And we're also running multiple um, storm directions. So as especially in an area like this, we talked about before, exposure is huge. The 100 year storm that, you know, basically hits Magoo is going to, right about here, is going to be maybe a lot different from the one that hits Gaviota or Santa Monica. So we wrote 
we were running a lot of different storm scenarios, so-called 20-year storm, to make sure we get it right at each location. Um, and then once we get down to very, very fine scale, and we've run all these things through, these models are coupled to a cross-shore profile model called X-Beach, which basically simulates infragravity energy in the surf zone. So if you're ever standing on the beach and for five minutes and all of a sudden the water comes up to your kneecaps, it's infragravity energy. It's this trapped energy in the surf zone that gets released every 60 seconds up to five minutes or so from wave groups. So very few models do that, and, but it's a huge factor in California. We have long period waves. It pretty much dominates the water level signal, so you need a, a really good model for doing that. And then we also integrate this um, with fluvial discharge out of the watersheds, vertical land motion, and then also how is the beach itself going to change? The beach is dynamic. It's not going to be static. So how does the beach evolve through time, and what's it going to look like in 50 years, and then what's the storm on top of that going to look like? So we're trying to get a handle on that as well. So these are the highlights. Working with lots of folks actually across the West Coast and beyond. The big addition in Southern California is, is evolving the coast, coastal evolution. It's something we didn't want to tackle before, but the models are at the point now we can actually do some good work on it. Um, and then we also have locally downscaled winds from Dan Kane's group. So formally we just downscaled our wave climate, but there's also locally generated waves like inside the Santa Barbara Channel that are important. So we have that, um, the rivers, and what we just released, and we're about to release the full suite of scenarios this summer, but we have out now, which is available for downloading, looking at Google Earth right now, it's going to soon be in the, our coast, our future product, is the extreme events, the 100-year storm events. This is what the state wanted to see as soon as possible. Give us a series of sea level rise scenarios and the worst case events we can start planning now. Because everybody wants stuff like yesterday. And uh, the state did a lot of planning and policy guidance that really re relied on having data that wasn't available. So we're trying to play catch up. So I'm going to give you some flooding um, sort of projections for some areas you may or may not be familiar with. Hopefully you're familiar with most of them in the Santa Barbara littoral cell area. And so I'm going to highlight all these areas here, you know, Santa Barbara, Harbor, <coughs> and uh, so Galita, Santa Barbara, Harbor, Carp and uh, then the whole sort of a, uh, you know, alluvial plain here down in the Oxnard um, Ventura area. So you're going to see in light blue is going to be zero meters of sea level rise up to two meters of sea level rise in the warmer colors plus a hundred year storm. Okay, so here is Golita and you see now even with, if we move, bump it up to a hundred year storm event with no sea level rise, there's a lot of vulnerability. And this is something to look out for across the coast. You see some areas where the vulnerability is now, the storm now, and other ones it's not until you get to a certain threshold, maybe it's half a meter of sea level rise or a meter or whatever. But with Goleta, it's very much near term. Um, with Santa Barbara Harbor area, it's a little bit further out. I mean, there's certainly some vulnerability, but it then sort of increases stepwise as you go further and further out um, in time and with the sea level rise. So these are, you know, 50 centimeters is, you know, roughly maybe mid, sort of mid-century, maybe end of century, and depending what projection you look at, this could be even further out. It could be sooner than later, though. So Carpinteria, another site um, where there's a really big vulnerability in the very near term. If you had an extreme event, the biggest one of our lifetimes, this is what the flooding picture might look like. Um, Ventura River Mouth, um, kind of the same pattern. Um, really significant. A lot of this is also due to the flooding out of the watershed, um, but extensive flooding. And this is kind of the whole alluvial plain here. I'm going to highlight some of these areas in a little more detail, you know, from Santa Clara River down to the, the harbor mouse and then all the way down to Magoo. Um, some very areas, areas where there's very extensive potential flooding. Um, so Pierpont, um, Again, further out, looks like most of the vulnerability, not a lot of real short-term impacts from flooding. Uh, Santa Clara River Mouth, um, similarly up the river mouth maybe, but not until you get to the upper uh, sea level rise projections are you really seeing a lot of um, potential flooding. And similar feature here around Channel Islands and Wainini Harbors, um, where you need a little bit more sea level rise to really see severe impacts, a couple with an extreme storm. Um, not as so much the case in Magoo where you have a pretty big tongue here, potential flooding during an extreme event today, potentially today, um, but very extensive geographic potential flooding in the future. Okay, 
So I'm going to finish up with the coastal change part of it. And this is a model that Sean Batusik built. So he kind of mentioned there's the flooding, but then how does the, the beach itself evolve? And uh, so I just want to introduce this model very briefly. It's a hybrid model. It assumes that we're going to not erode past the urban interface. And it also um, projects historical rates. But the main thing to uh, understand is that it's trying to incorporate all the different processes that would evolve the coast in the future. So how sediment moves along shore, how it moves cross shore, how it's going to be affected by sea level rise, and how it's going to be affected by sediment supply and also anthropogenic sources. So it's sort of a Frankenstein model, um, integrating a lot of sort of state of the art work that's been done over the years um, into one like clean picture. But the big, really a big advance here is this data assimilation um, technique, which I'm going to show you here. And this will run through a few times. So what the model actually does, which is nice, almost every model has these parameters and no one is really sure what value they should be where you are. They're very site specific. <laughs> you know, you kind of take a guess. So Sean started right here um, for these parameters, but what the model does, this is the wave height, the wave time series that we use. Um, this is just a little bit of historical and then it starts to make projections, but every time there's a shoreline change measurement, as you'll see as it goes through again, the model sort of self-tunes itself and says, okay, here's an event, that's how it responded, so I'm going to change these parameters until we're kind of nicely tuned, hopefully well enough, so once we run out of data, we can then make projections in the future and have a lot more confidence in them, so that's a Kalman filter technique. And we have this for every single transect, 5,000 transects for the entire um, Southern California coast. Okay, so what does it mean in the end? Okay, well, I'll look at a few sites for looking at how the shoreline is projected to behave. This is Isla Vista, where there's almost no beach anyway. So just half a meter of sea level rise, and we're already against the cliffs. So there's really no, hardly any beach now, there's not going to be in the future. Uh, Rincon, for example, takes longer, but you almost in most cases, when you get to the upper level sea level rise scenarios, you're getting slammed up against the bluffs or the cliffs um, eventually. Um, same thing, Ventura. Um, we're seeing you know, long term erosion and eventually loss of the, of the beach. And the big issue in a lot of these areas is that these beaches are squeezed by infrastructure, so they don't have a place to evolve. If you're in a passive margin setting with a big barrier island, this barrier island can overtop and move, but we can't move anywhere. Uh, we have a, a gigantic, you know, city here um, with you know 10 million people in LA County alone, right? So, and uh, so that's a big problem. Okay, so cliffs. I'll just talk about those briefly, and then that'll be that. So there's all these different factors that drive cliff erosion, but surprisingly. Um, very few have been included in models before um, Pat Limber, a postdoc we have, started really looking at it and trying to build a really nice model. So we know rock strength matters, so sandy, very friable cliffs are going to erode faster. Um, but almost all cliff models only look at wave energy and water levels. But cliffs fail when it rains. I mean, that's pretty much common knowledge, <laughs> but it's a confluence of factors. So when these waves um, attack the toe of the cliff, and Pat has a little cartoon here. It causes, this, and then we have sea level rise, it's going to attack the cliff more and more and more. And so the more impact you have on the cliff, the faster the cliffs are going to erode, and that's basically the concept. Um, and they're going to erode faster if the cliffs are looser material, and they're going to erode faster if it rains more. So Pat tried to pull together some of the latest models and build something a little more robust. And this is just an example looking at cliff retreat rates if you look at waves only, which is what most models look at. But if you include rain and sea level rise, it's a much different um, picture. And this is just showing uh, several hundred years of cliff retreat of a model. And you see it's sort of this punctuated equilibrium type of behavior where it doesn't really do much, maybe for a little bit, and then it fails. So you know, the average retreat rate in the California coast is about a foot a year for cliffs. But it doesn't happen a foot every year. It might happen zero for 20 years, and you get 20 feet of, of cliff retreat in one instant or one storm. So, it's a very stepwise process. And a lot of these more high relief areas, sea level rise is not an issue in terms of flooding, but if you look at cliff retreat, it's a big issue. This is up in Cernio El Cap um, toward Gaviota, and you see these are long-term projections, sort of bands of potential cliff um, retreat over the next century or so. 
and you see 101 clearly being impacted in a quite a short time frame. If you look at a place like Isla Vista, where they've like cut buildings in half, and some of you have seen, maybe you've had a beer in one of those places, <laughs> I don't know, but uh, it's pretty <laughs> significant in terms of the long-term um, retreat of the cliffs in these urbanized areas. And it looks like this along the entire California coast. We've built so close to the edge of the cliffs it's natural for these cliffs to erode in the absence of sea level rise. That's what the cliffs do. That's why they're there. Um, and so like Hope Ranch, for example, these are pretty conservative estimates as well. And the Mesa and Santa Barbara, looking at um, long-term projections, um, very common anywhere in the state you look at, people are built up right to the very, very edge. And San Diego County is probably the worst in the entire state in terms of buildings and infrastructure right on the edge of the cliff. And, vulnerable in the future. So the last thing I'll just mention is that one of the things we're now trying to work on is we have all these flooding projections and to some they're very nebulous and no one understands what they really mean and what do they do, but if you talk to a policy person, they wanna know about how many people are affected and how many dollars are affected. So we're now building this module in Cosmos to look at the socioeconomic impacts. So you know, maybe 100 hectares doesn't mean anything of flood extent to someone, but if you say, well, it's $5 billion and 10,000 people, then policy may change or people may listen and try and, and make some decisions about how to mitigate this. So these are going to come out actually for the Bay Area next month to in sort of in parallel to the physical impacts is these socioeconomic impacts as well. Okay, and later this summer, we're going to have the full suite of scenarios for Southern California. I just showed the extreme ones um, with the morphology integrated into the flood mapping. There's also going to be the tool in Southern California covering your area as well, so you can go in there and play with all the data much more easily. Right now, it's all Google Earth-based stuff, which is you know kind of fun, but not as cool as this. <laughs> and then this web tool will be available, the socioeconomic tool, and also um, uh, the user interface I just mentioned. And there's a couple other projects that we're working on in concert. Um, you know, groundwater is probably globally the number one factor that's going to impact um, political unrest um, and global security issues with sea level rise. Um, it's going to displace probably tens and hundreds of millions of people, especially in Asia, because there's not going to be any drinking water because of saltwater intrusion. And we're just barely even scratching the surface here. And there's lots of issues now in Southern California, I mentioned earlier in your class, just with corrosion of pump facilities, almost every community, all their sewage infrastructure is right at sea level because everything flows downhill and they pump it out. And those areas are seeing more saltwater intrusion and they're having lots of issues. And there's also backwater flooding associated with the groundwater. So as if the water table is really shallow and sea level rise goes up and the water table intersects the surface, all of a sudden you have a swamp. So um, there's a Malibu Creek is an area where that's a major factor when we've done some really simple pilot work. And there was a study done in Honolulu, Waikiki, which showed that Honolulu is going to be flooded more by groundwater intercepting the land surface than from flooding from the ocean. Because the whole back was built on a swamp basically, you know, 100 years ago or whatever. And the water table is super shallow, so sea level rise goes up, it becomes a swamp. So that's a big issue. The other thing we're working on is looking at hurricanes and whether the warmer water, the changing global climate will result in more hurricanes in Southern California. We've had like one hit made landfall in San Diego over the last 150 years. So the question is, could we have a, more hurricanes like make landfall in Southern California? And if we do have more, will that just completely trump these storms we're modeling right now? Will a tropical event just be so extreme that it'll make what we're doing now almost insignificant? That's a science question we're trying to answer. So that's on the horizon. Um, happy to answer questions. My email too, if you need anything, and a couple of websites. And thank you so much for uh, staying awake. <laughs> and happy to answer questions.